Does Vladimir Putin have an ideology? That's the topic for today's discussion. My name is Max Bergman. I am the director of the Europe, Russia, Eurasia program and the Stuart Center here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. And today we'll have an excellent conversation and debate regarding the ideology of Putinism. Does Vladimir Putin have an ideology? Will this ideology help him to strengthen his hold on power? And what does all this mean for Western policymakers trying to understand Russia today? We will do our best to answer these questions uh, and more over the course of the next hour. And I'm delighted to be joined with two uh, fantastic guests. Um, the first is my colleague, uh, Dr. Maria Snegovaya, who is our senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia here at CSIS. And next, we are joined by our special guest, uh, beaming in from Paris, uh, Professor Sergei Guriev. Sergei is the provost at Sciences Po in Paris, in addition to his appointment as professor of economics. Uh, previously, he led the new, school, the new economic school in Moscow from 2004 to 2013. Additionally, he served as the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction uh, and Development from 2016 to 2019. And before we get in to today's discussion, I'd like to point our viewers toward a few different publications. The first is Sergey's uh, excellent book, along with Daniel Treisman, uh, which is titled Spin Doctors, The Changing Face of Tyranny in the 21st Century. And Sergey, I'm doing some nice promotion for you here, uh, holding up your book. Uh, in this book, Sergey and his co-author describe the features of contemporary dictatorships and argue that Vladimir Putin and his regime do not in fact, possess a coherent ideology. Um, and this stands in sort of stark contrast to a recent paper that Maria and some of our other colleagues uh, recently published with our two senior associates, non-resident fellows here at CSS, Michael, Michael Kimmage and Jade McGlynn. The paper is titled The Ideology of Putinism, Is It Sustainable? and is available at CSIS.org. In the paper, Maria and her co-authors argue that Vladimir Putin does, in fact, have an ideology, one with serious uh, impacts on his governing style and approach to foreign affairs. Uh, this paper was part of a larger project made possible by the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, titled Russia in the World After 2022, Moscow's Foreign and Domestic Policy in a Time of Change. And we're thrilled to announce that our summary report for the first year of this project is out now on our website. And we encourage you to take a look through all the papers that we have uh, in our live stream events and podcast episodes that make up uh, the project's completed analysis thus far. But without further ado, let's jump into it. Maria, you are the co-author of what I think is an excellent uh, a, a paper on Putin's ideology. Maybe you could outline the, the basic tenets of what, what your argument is. Why, why do you think Putin is an ideology? Uh, thank you very much to thank the CSIS and Sergi for the opportunity uh, to organize this discussion, uh, which I think is very, very important, uh, because it will uh, determine, the first of all, the direction of Putin's regime, uh, which I think is highly, highly important from the foreign policy perspective, and more broadly, the evolution of today's authoritarianism, uh, which is what the book uh, by Sergi and Dan Trisman is really about. So we really want to understand how this dynamic unravels. Um, so in the report uh, with Jade McGlynn and Mike Kimmich, we argue uh, that uh, indeed uh, there is an ideology. You can really talk today of the ideology of Putin's regime. Uh, many scholars who claimed otherwise actually looked at the dynamic of the regime before, and indeed it was quite eclectic. And we show in our report how over time the regime was sort of in the search for uh, the, and here I'm using actually Sergei's definition, social or political doctrine endorsed by top officials that influences the content of laws. Uh, we argue that it looks like the war, uh, unfortunate, horrible war that Putin has started in Ukraine in 2022, finally uh, was a culmination of this process of search. And the resulting doctrine that emerged, it may not be maybe uh, summarized in one particular uh, book, say like Capital by Marx. Uh, but by the way, Mar Marx, Marx's Capital is actually very uh, incons inconsistent as mm -hmm. well. So that may be not the best example even of a very coherent doctrine doctrine. Uh, but we argue that uh, the key tenets 
of the um, ideology, the, of the, uh, the ideologies that the Putin regime is putting forward are quite consistent, coherent over time. So what are they? Uh, first of all, the key is the emphasis of what we describe as imperial nationalist statism, de facto sacralization of a strong, stable state, uh, which actually the key idea that has been with Putin uh, from the start is just kind of has been blown out of the proportion uh, recently. Uh, the state is the only thing, as the regime, as the, the claim goes, that holds Russia together. Uh, and uh, there are unfortunate periods of weakness, like the 1990s Russia, or periods of liberalization in Russian history. But in general, it's been preserved for over thousands of years. It's exceptional and unique. Uh, here the emphasis goes on the cultural conservatism, the special values that Russia embraces. Most importantly, it's a civilization state. Uh, and this is the theme that's been consistent with Putin since at least 2012-13. Um, if you listen to the recent Putin speech at Valdai conference, he makes this particular point. And this cultural, civilizational uniqueness of Russia, which is almost racist, if you look uh, and re read uh, many of the um, uh, works that flag it, um, it actually justifies Russia's claims of a specific international status and determines foreign policy. And here we have actually a direct link to how that converts into laws. It also determines a very uh, strong anti-Western uh, stance of this uh, civilization state because, as the official ideological line claims, uh, the Russian civilization state is consistently under threat. Um, and it did collapse in the 20th century. Indeed, it actually true collapsed at least twice in 1917 and then as when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, and the threat comes directly from the West uh, because, as the official uh, ideology claims, the um, uh, it beat Polish-Lithuanian forces or Napoleon or Hitler, allegedly the only threat to the Russian state, which is unique, which is holding this Russian civilization together, all, always came from the West. And here we have a very nice link to this alleged Nazism, which also comes from the West. Uh, and now the recent uh, manifestation of this, allegedly again, as the Kremlin claim, claims, is um, unraveling in Ukraine under backing from the West. And last but not the least, uh, the cult of the Second World War. Russia's victory in the Great Patriotic War is very important here, as Russia did win against uh, Western-backed Nazism back then. Uh, in uh, 1945, it will win again. So as you can see, first of all, the narrative is very coherent. It's uh, consistent. It's been uh, evolving, but finally shaped, uh, as we argue, over the last 10, 15 uh, years under Putin's rule. Most importantly, it is directly converted into policymaking. It does justify Russia's persistent anti-Western stance. It is codified in uh, Russia's foreign policy doctrines and national security doctrines. And last but not least, unfortunately, it determines uh, Russia's horrible st uh, actions on the international stage, as the war in Ukraine has demonstrated. Great. Sergey, let me bring you in. Um, you're co-author of the excellent book, Spin Doctors. Uh, and, and so I think you take issue with whether there's a sort of a core defined ideology uh, emanating from the Kremlin. And and maybe you could ex expand on that and 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 react to, to what, what Maria outlined, but also outline your core thesis in, in, in your excellent book. Thank you very much, uh, Max and uh, Maria for inviting me. Uh, I indeed am a co-author of this book, Spin uh, Dictators, where we talk about the qualitative change in the nature of non-democratic regimes. We still have ideological regimes in the world. And uh, I will mention that in a second, today's Russia is probably becoming much more ideological than say a couple of years ago. But, um, uh, the majority of modern non-democratic regimes are indeed uh, spin dictatorships, dictatorships that uh, thrive on manipulation of information, pretending to be democracies. You can even see that visually, that when you look at the ideological dictator, a dictator from 20th century, you would see somebody in military or paramilitary uniform to project the image of force and fear. Today's dictators are dressed like me or you, Max, in a gray suit. Uh, they go to Davos, they shake hands with the democratic leaders. That's uh, what they do for a living. Now, uh, regarding regarding the report, I think the report is excellent, and I don't actually disagree with the, um, with the main thesis of the report that Putin's been building uh, ideological stance uh, for years. I disagree with timing. I think before, say, 2020, you can't actually claim that Russia is ideological state. 
Why I'm mentioning 2020? Because that was the time when Putin enshrined certain things into the law, in the law of the land, constitution. That constitution still said, literally, that Russia doesn't have an ideology. That was not changed by Putin. So this is still part of Russian constitution. On the other hand, uh, that constitution already mentioned that uh, uh, marriage is a uh, marriage between men and women. It mentioned God in the constitution. Well, U.S. constitution also is not uh, too, too agnostic, right? But still, uh, overall, you can see a lot of the stuff that Maria has been talking about already enshrined in the law of the land, Russian constitution 2020, changed by Putin. And uh, this is indeed different from it, uh, what it uh, used to be before. So uh, the report talks about several things which are very interesting. First and foremost, it talks about plasticity of uh, Russian ideological uh, stunts, where Putin says one thing here, the other thing there. And until very recently, you can find pretty much everything in Putin's speeches. Until 2022 and certainly until 2020, you want to find a liberal Putin speech, every year you can find a liberal Putin speech. You want to see an anti-Western Putin speech, you can do that. You want to find a pro-status speech. Maria talks a lot about the importance of status, governance and economic model. You will find a speech by Putin like this, but uh, when Putin speaks to business people and foreign business people, he would say, we are the most important market economy, our taxes are low, we love foreign investors. And the report, of course, recognizes this heterogeneity and diversity of Putin's uh, narratives. And it says that it's because Putin sells it to different, to different audiences in a different way. And here is where I get the issue with the definition. Uh, because uh, there, if you have an ideology that it is not enshrined in the law, and it's not actually implemented in practices and rituals, this is what the report recognizes, is that if ideology is just cheap talk, this is not really an ideology. So uh, you talk about uh, Althusser, uh, who define ideology as something which has ideological state apparatus, practices, and in rituals, not just cheap talk. Here, it is much more difficult before 2020 and before 2022 to find uh, ideological uh, ideological practices and rituals. So uh, when we talk about programmatic statements, when we talk about uh, uh, when we talk about the way Putin's bureaucracy works, this is not very easy to find uh, uh, to find things which are too ideological. Yes, there is uh, there is homophobia starting somewhat probably from 2012. Yes, there is an increasing role of the church in uh, Russian life, also starting in 2012. Uh, but uh, do we actually see uh, the things which we only started to observe in 2020, uh, where uh, uh, homosexual, homosexuals uh, are actually uh, more or less cleansed? And when, uh, when uh, Putin makes uh, homophobic and anti-Semitic jokes, this is uh, something, uh, something which is uh, quite recent. Moreover, in 2014, Orthodox Church did not support, as you know, the annexation of Crimea for a very simple reason. Orthodox Church didn't want to lose its influence in Ukraine. It was very clear that Putin's uh, war in Ukraine in 2014 was actually not good news uh, for support for uh, Orthodox Church in in uh, Ukraine. So a couple of other things I would like to mention. If you think about doctrines, you mentioned foreign policy doctrine. Eventually, these doctrines are uh, written down in uh, programmatic documents. Uh, and if you look, for example, at the uh, uh, 2012 May decree. So in 2012, Putin, when he was inaugurated, when he started his job as president, uh, for the next time, probably the third time. It's very hard to count Putin's presidential terms, but I think most people would call uh, Putin's 2012 term as a third term. So on May, two, May 7, 2012, Putin signed a, a presidential, a set of presidential decrees saying, in economics, we do this. In uh, foreign policy, we do that. In domestic policy, we do that. In uh, nation, national ethnical policy, we do that. There you see nothing like nationalism, you don't see priority of Russian nation. Occasionally, you hear things like Russian language is a language of uh, 
uh, state shape and ethnicity, something like this. But Russian language is actually uh, uh, enshrined in Russian constitution as a state language. Um, then in foreign policy doctrine, you don't see uh, nationalism. The same thing if you look at the May decree in 2012, when Putin um, started his current presidential term, he did not actually prescribe uh, what would uh, happen. He didn't write in this, uh, in this uh, particular uh, presidential decree that we are going to invade Ukraine. And uh, at that point, he also didn't say that I will change constitution and there will be a marriage uh, being a union of uh, men and women. And so in that sense, I think it's a much more recent thing. He may have worked on this, but uh, at any time before 2020, it was very hard to say that you have an ideology uh, in trying somewhere. Now, let me talk a few, uh, say a few things about etatism and statism that you are saying is a very important part of uh, Putin's ideology. So as a scholar of uh, uh, transition to market from state to market and a scholar of privatization and can assure you every government wants to grab as much power as it wants. And uh, this is why we have a lot of governments which have more government resources in their pockets than Putin does. So if you look formally at this uh, share of GDP uh, that is uh, uh, spent by the government, what's called gen general government expenditure. So how much government, federal, national, local, uh, subnational, municipal, how much all the governments in the economy spend, you will see that among OECD countries, and Russia is not an OECD country, but among OECD countries, Russia would be somewhere in the middle. It would not be the most etatist country in the world. The most etatist country in the world is the great Republic of France. Uh, this is where I'm sitting. This is where this ratio is in the range of 55% in some years, 57 or 59% of GDP. Then on the other extreme, you have Ireland, which is in the range of 25%. And Russia is, depending on the year, is 35, 40%. So it's, it's not formally a very etatist country. As I mentioned, taxes, are actually not that high. And especially taxes when you exclude oil taxes, which is, of course, taxes that uh, uh, that are mostly paid by uh, foreign buyers of Russian oil and not, and not Russian consumers and not Russian workers. And so when you think about this, of course, etatism in your understanding comes from a very simple feature of Putin's regime. He runs the country. He is like Louis XIV. He says, the state is me, and I run this country. And that means you can be private or public, but you depend on me. Mm -hmm. You need a big loan, you come to me. You need defense against uh, KGB, you come to me. And this is a big difference. Even private business in Russia, of course, knows they have to fear Putin, have to fear the state, which is the tool of Putin. And this is why we do have a lot of private business, and they know that they're actually uh, potential victims of the state. And this is where the statism, as you define it, comes from. And this is not statism. It's just mm -hmm. absence of rule of law. This is just personalistic dictatorial regime. And this is how it works. And this is why Russia is not prosperous, because uh, investment climate is bad. If you want to invest in Russia, you have to have insurances of Putin. And that happens to be the case for some people, but not others. So is the private empire of somebody like uh, uh, Mikhail, uh, sorry, Yuri Kavalchuk, is it private? Yes, it's private. He owns all kinds of businesses, but he owns them because he's a friend of Mr. Putin and he's always happy to support whatever political or personal spending items of Mr. Putin. And uh, uh, the same is true for many other private oligarchs who happen to be friendly to Putin or happen to be his friends from high school, university, or KGB service. And this is not status. It's just discretion. It's just the dictatorial power, which is unchecked. And this is, this is I think, what we call status, which is, in fact, um, a, a lack of uh, equality uh, before the law and uh, protection by independent judiciary. Mr. Putin has worked hard on this all these 20 years. And uh, in the book, we actually s show how you eliminate um, checks and balances by, by one by one, how you use manipulation of information 
to gain popularity, which allows you to crush constitutional checks and balances and become a dictator. And then uh, I'll stop here. Uh, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to talk uh, about the future of such regimes, but uh, I guess I guess um, we should we should not allow speaking too much of origins. No, no, no. That was uh, excellent. And Maria, I'm going to turn to you in a second to push back. But Sergey, I want to maybe push you a bit on on the statism point. Because I, I, I definitely take your point when it revolves around the economy. However, it does strike me that one of the core tenets of Putin's reign has been to reestablish the power of the Kremlin uh, within Russia and and then also Russia's broader great power status uh, as you know, sort of a, a byproduct of the KGB and the Russian intelligence services wanting to essentially make Russia uh, great again on the world stage, but then also wanting to make the economy revolve around the state and revolve around him does strike me as something that's been very consistent going back the, the more than 20 years that Putin hasn't been in power. So is that not a tenant of ideology that, that really drives Putin? Uh, for me, it's, it's a normal um, tendency in any regime to grab more political power. I mentioned privatization. No single politician in any country wants to privatize. Sometimes they say they want to privatize, but privatization is losing control over resources. And that's why privatization is so unpopular everywhere. Politicians make sure that they they grab as much resources as they want. Sometimes there are ideological politicians, uh, liberal or neoliberal economic uh, policies are sometimes pushed by people who just hate state ownership. But uh, more often than not, uh, statism in the way you're talking about, control over ec economic resources is just the tendency of political um, parties and politicians to be more powerful. And some countries push back, say we have independence of the judiciary system, we have independence of the media, we have checks and balances within the political system, parliament is sovereign, parliament is independent of the president, or you have in the, in, in the United States, you have power of the states. And indeed, somebody like Putin or somebody like one former US president would like to crush those checks and balances, would like to uh, subvert the democratic, uh, democratic mechanisms exactly to gain more power. Putin has succeeded, and the book actually tells you how he succeeded. But it's not because he wants to be the greatest jail of political player, but because he wants to grab more power. And this is this is where modern dictators succeed. Um, and this is what uh, Erdogan has done less successfully than Putin, right? This is what Orban has done probably less successfully than Putin. This is what um, that uh, American president that may become president again wants to do. And so far, he's not been successful. Berlusconi also tried to grab control of media for that particular reason. And this is again something that Putin has done, and this is super important, and this is completely in line with what Maria is saying. What I'm saying is from the day one, Putin wanted to go step by step to get, grab control of media sphere until he arrived at the situation where he said, I control everything which matters for informational environment. And you had some private channels, sure, but he had to control them through various means, sometimes through threats and sometimes through implementation of those threats. So the story of TV channel Dosh, TV Rain, is the story as a small channel started to grow. They were warned by administration of the president, you shouldn't grow too much and you shouldn't speak too much about this, this and this. And eventually they were kicked out of cable and they're much smaller now than they used to be. And uh, and then yet Putin tolerated those channels as, lo as long as they were small and uh, did not actually require everybody to translate the same ideology. He allowed for some ideological diversity because he thought uh, it's good to pretend to be a Democrat so he can be admitted to Davos and he can talk to German politicians and push through the Nord Stream 2 project. 
Can I, so can I just jump sense, in here, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, to, sorry sure. to interrupt. So actually, I think we should be careful not to uh, conflate the economic control with what me, uh, we define as statism is in this report, specifically the political uh, emphasis on the primacy of the state interest, uh, which is also promoted in Russia through the form of the so-called patriotism uh, since at least 2016. And uh, patriotism uh, is this umbrella term essentially for embracing everything that the state does. Uh, quick uh, mention that it's also consistent with the way the Russians uh, view uh, patriotism. They have a strong inclination towards so-called blind patriotism. Uh, my country right or wrong, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point being is that uh, that may or may not include total control over the economy, even if certainly I agree with Sergey that as a degree of control will be there. But uh, where ideology is different, is not identical, uh, to state control is, for example, uh, in the case of Hitler. Hitler's regime, I don't think anybody of, disagrees that it was quite ide ideological, but still allowed a degree of private, uh, you know, private businesses to exist, uh, and so uh, did other, uh, for example, regimes. It's more, nonetheless, uh, certainly Hitler's regime promoted very strong ideology, you know, was about certainly uh, racism, uh, the primacy of the Aryan race and whatnot. Uh, and so does Putin. So I certainly, while I'll agree that uh, the, a degree of control over independence, uh, independent movement within the society always preclude a, a growing, growing role of the state, I don't think it's identical to uh, the um, necessarily just consolidating uh, economic control. And frankly, I don't necessarily think that you need a very clear vision of the, uh, specifically of the, um, um, of how the state operates in the economy for the state to have an ideology, um, we uh, certainly can uh, certainly see and envision a degree of interventionism. Certainly, uh, as a private businessman in Russia, you cannot go beyond making a certain amount of money until uh, you have you need to have certain connections, certain agreements. But uh, it's very different from, for example, organizing an independent political protest. Right? You may uh, have your own business running and paying your taxes, but try organizing, say, anti-war protest, and well, you'll go to jail. And that's the difference, I think between the political angle of ideology as opposed to the economic uh, one. Uh, so second point, um, many of, um, so I'm actually happy that, Sergey, you agree with the fact that uh, today's Putin probably has an ideology, or at least it's been shaping. Uh, on your timing point, um, we actually, uh, I agree, we certainly do not disagree with your point that it's been shaping over the time. We, however, noticed that since 2010s, since mid-2010s, so in the post-Crimea period, uh, there's an increase in indoctrination, unraveling in the Russian society. The state goes beyond, the Kremlin moves beyond just promotion of certain narratives, which, as Sergei has pointed out and we point out, uh, took time to shape. But the indoctrination picks up very, very strongly, specifically in mid-2010s. Uh, and this includes multiple initiatives, clubs, camps, uh, battle reenactments, uh, historical tourism, and most importantly, I'd say, a series of multimedia historical part parks uh, called Russia My History. At this point, uh, they have like 20 or 30 of such parks across all of Russia. I've been to one of them in St. Petersburg. I have to say, yeah, it's uh, it's a very uh, strong emphasis on the supremacy of the Russian, again, the state that historically held uh, the whole uh, country uh, together. And why is state so important? So first of all, you have, as I mentioned before, you need to follow what the state tells you to do. Um, second of all, it's certainly destruction of any alternative identity. Uh, in Russia, unfortunately, an alternative, say, pro-Western vision of Russian identity, that which includes also emphasis on more or bigger role of the independent groups, it failed to shape in the 1990s. Under Yeltsin, everybody kept searching for the so-called national idea, but generally there was a void. Um, and when Putin came back, uh, he um, essentially took the easiest path, and also the most probably beneficial for him personally, for the reasons that Serge emphasized, going back to this idea of the great imperial Russia, where interests of an individual are subordinated to the bigger cause of the state that um, has been promoted uh, under the Soviet times. And unfortunately, this is why uh, we envision this ideology building effort to be successful. I mean, first of all, we haven't seen much of the resistance uh, even in the last decade, uh, but going forward, Forward, um, is going to be probably successful partly because there was a deep demand uh, for belonging, uh, 
uh, within the Russian society, uh, the void that's been created by the end of the Soviet system uh, that in the 1990s uh, failed to find any other kind of application. And catering to that demand is one of the things why Putin makes it, um, one Putin's ideology building effort, I argue, is successful. Um, to uh, Sergei's point about um, the timing, though, I wanted to flag that maybe, since we both agree, seem to agree, that the regime is ultimately shaping uh, this ideology. Maybe, after all, contemporary autocracies are not the different from the old ones. Maybe what was different, maybe was the international environment, for example, of the 1990s, 2000s, when for the moment it really felt like uh, the good <laughs> side of history, liberal democracy won, and uh, neoliberal, say, kind of neoliberalism won, and uh, it was harder for autocratic regimes to find um, immediately find an alternative uh, response to it. Today, unfortunately, we live in a very different moment with the perceived uh, weakening of the of the West, and hence we see the resurgence again of these autocratic crocodiles, uh, so to speak, all over the world that are shaping, um, getting stronger. Part of that is oil prices that are certainly helping, and they are they are coming up with this sort of ideological responses uh, to what used to be the Western uh, global dominance. Um, in addition to that, I think part of what uh, Sergei and Dan identifies, the spin dictatorship, is just the changing nature of the media environment. Unlike what used to be the case in the Stalin's period, it's much harder right now, right, for the states, for autocrats to control the media mm -hmm. monopoly. And so instead of maybe pushing forward one uh, exclusive doctrine, which, by the way, was never exclusive even under Stalin. It was quite, uh, um, even under Stalin's Soviet period, it actually was quite changeable. For example, both Stalin and Brezhnev, they heavily borrowed during periods, certain periods of their rule from Russian nationalism, just as Putin does. So this perception of uh, this Soviet Marxist doctrine as being something unchangeable and fixed, I think is also not entirely correct. So right. that's, that's maybe why we see the contemporary autocrats are using ideology in a slightly different way, but ultimately they're not as different. To, to maybe just um, characterize Sergei's argument first, uh, it, it does seem that perhaps you know, Putin wants to have an ideology, uh, but is constantly searching to try to figure out what that ideology is. And really the ideology that Putin actually has is just trying to stay in power. And so whatever he can find to justify it and strengthen his position, he does. So it's a shape-shifting uh, approach, and, and hence the spin dictators. Uh, May I just answer to that real quick, yeah. and then Sergei, sorry. Yeah, and, so, then, and then I think there's a lot on the plate for, yeah, for Sergei. Certainly. To but yeah. Um, so uh, certainly, but first of all, all most autocrats use ideology to stay in power. It's the main reason why they need ideology. They need to explain to the people why they can't give freedoms to people and why they should be in control, right? Yeah. But in case of Putin, though, it goes beyond that. It transforms into quite a pronounced uh, foreign policy stances that are actually not as good for Putin's survival in power if you think of 2022 war in Ukraine and what it means for Putin's long term. Certainly created more challenges than uh, actually facilitated Putin's survival in power. So it's both a way to legitimize staying in power and at the same time uh, certain other foreign policy, policies that are not necessarily only served to stay in power. They go beyond just a selfish a selfish reasons. It's, it's a bigger cause, so to right. speak, unfortunately. And the second point, while we all agree there was this unraveling search for the 20 years, as we argue in our report, and that's the key point, the search has been quite consistent. It focused on specific set of themes, even if called different names. Right? It was never about embrace of liberal Western democracy, for example. Like There was limited within a specific repertoire of topics that are actually ended up um, merging together and now constitute quite a coherent ideological core. Right. I think that's a... A great point that, you know, in some ways, Putin's anti-Westernism, which has really come out post-2007, is probably you know, against Putin's interests in some ways in staying in power. If he tried to de-escalate tensions with the West, uh, I think the West would be quite happy to deal with an illiberal autocratic government in, in Russia. But, but Sergei, uh, back to you. And maybe one point to you could touch on, you know, one thing that really comes out of the paper that Maria, Michael, and Jade wrote is that... You know, there is an effort in Russia by Putin to, uh, you know, sort of indoctrinate the educational system about Russian history and to create a singular narrative 
about uh, you know the the great patriotic war and also about the the need for a strong state. So I'm curious how 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 you think of the, that kind of manipulation or uh, attention focused on having kind of a coherent narrative uh, in the Russian educational system uh, that has been placed by the, the Putin regime. But over to you, Sergey. Uh, thank you, thank you, Max. Uh, so indeed, as you rightly said, uh, I would like to respond to several points uh, made by Maria. And uh, let me first answer your question, which was, also man which was also mentioned by Maria. This is indoctrination and history textbooks. So unified history textbook was produced this year. And Maria correctly says that the author of this textbook, Medinsky, uh, who was a minister of culture at some point, uh, president's assistant uh, aide at another point, uh, already said those things 10 years ago. I fully agree with that. But this is exactly the difference. 10 years ago, uh, Russian academics could actually attack Medinsky openly and even almost uh, proven that his uh, PhD thesis was plagiarized. They actually proven that. And it's just by, um, by the intervention by the state, uh, here I agree with Maria, he was defended from losing his academic status. And yet in 2023, this uh, textbook is a unified history textbook. And this is real indoctrination. So when you have patriotic camps, uh, I fully agree it's indoctrination, but it's not ideological. You can still send your kid to a school where you would have a different view of history. And history, I fully agree with Maria and Marx, is a cornerstone of uh, Putin's ideology as well as many other ideologies. You have to rewrite history to be able to convince your audience that your ideology is right. Uh, but I think it is only now when we see uh, propaganda in schools. Now, kids, even now, kids can avoid that. But now it's much harder. In every school, you have those conversations about important issues imposed by the Russian states. This is something which happened only recently. Now, let me also say that the difference between patriotism and uh, control of the state is very clear. In the US, you also have patriotism. In the EU, you can say that there is a green ideology. The society is more or less united that we need to fight climate change. But you still have law. If you don't want to fight climate change, if the law doesn't require you to fight climate change, you are OK with that. If Putin decides that uh, you are not patriotic, then you lose your business. And here I fully agree with uh, Marie. Now, on Hitler, I think nobody has said that uh, Hitler had statism. I've never seen that. Uh, Hitler was a very right wing uh, dictator. And uh, of course, it was a totalitarian dictatorship. Of course, Hitler could destroy any single business who was against his ideology. But was it statism? No, Hitler allowed for private sector, as Maria correctly said, because Hitler was anti-communist. He, he didn't have this affinity to government ownership. He was against government ownership. And that was a different, different era. Now, on uh, the most important issue, uh, I, 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 I would very much like to emphasize the shape-shifting uh, uh, shape -shifting property of Putin's regime. This is exactly what these regimes are. They are shape-shifting over time, but also across places. You go to Munich to give 2007 speech, you give an anti-Western speech because you want to, to deliver a message. You go to Davos 2009, after Munich, you give a very liberal and humanist speech thinking about how we together, uh, we all together in this crisis should fight it together. And so this is exactly this is exactly how it works. These regimes pretend, these regimes deny, these regimes do things in a covered, deniable way. And this is where I would say 2014 is different from 2022. If you're ideological and you're proud of your ideology, you don't deny what you do. Putin denied that he an annexed Crimea. He said, it's not us. This is not my soldiers. I don't know what happened. And <laughs> Russian army has never been to East Ukraine. And this is a key sign that this is not an ideological dictator. He's ashamed of what he's doing. Ideology is something which is implemented in rituals and practices, in decisions, in most important decisions. And Putin denies his annexation of Crimea, his, his, uh, his uh, agency in annexation of Crimea in East Ukraine. Later on, he was forced to recognize that, uh, but, but he was not 
proudly saying we will invade like it was done in 2022. So I think this is the difference between spin dictators and traditional fear dictators. Now, Marie has correctly said that dictatorships have changed because of external environment. This is exactly what we discuss in the book. In chapter seven, we answer uh, the question why we think dictators have, uh, dictatorships have changed. And indeed, we say exactly what Marie has indicated correctly. International environment has changed. The West has changed. The Cold War is over. Media environment has changed. And that's why dictators have to be different. But they are qualitatively different. They deny that they are dictators. They pretend to be Democrats, exactly because international environment has changed. So I think I think uh, it's a uh, very important point. And one other thing on shape shifting and evolution of ideology. So let me just give you an, a historical, um, very important historical anecdote. When I was studying history of uh, Communist Party of Soviet Union in 1988, when I entered university, we used the same textbook as 40 years before. And this is exactly the indoctrination. This is the history textbooks which stick. And this was very important for Soviet machine that things don't, don't, don't change in the main uh, elements of the indoctrination. I knew what Lenin said. I studied Lenin. I wasn't told by Brezhnev that Lenin was wrong. I was told by Brezhnev that Lenin is right. And, uh, and that was no a shape-shifting ideology. That was a straight, strict, rigorous, and stable ideology. And I had rituals. I went to young Communist League meetings. I was fortunate not to join Communist Party. I was too young. But uh, these things existed. And these things continued in the same way, exactly because this was an ideology, as well as, uh, you rightly say, Hitler had an ideology. So this is very different from shape-shifting, when every other year you give, you give a different speech. Um, thank you very much, Sergey, and I'm glad that we agree on um, more than I hope. I thought at first we will. Uh, so to your point that contemporary dictatorships are changing, and I think it's also worth discussing what it means, the implications for foreign policy. So I think our point is that, uh, and this is where we slightly disagree with Dan uh, and Sergey, uh, they have been changing for a while. It was a temporary moment of weakness, but unfortunately we are back to ground zero, so to speak, now increasingly, that uh, again, with the perceived weakness of the West, the changing prices of, of commodities and other factors actually lead uh, to more, re re to the resurgence of a more traditional type of dictatorships. And yes, maybe Maybe there will be, say, the difference will be that pro Kremlin narratives will be now spread uh, not just through or the Pravda uh, newspaper, but also through Telegram channels uh, and Zed Patriots. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the repressiveness, the growing repressiveness and the growing uh, indoctrination kind of indicate that this is more or less the same uh, crocodiles and in the self wolf in mm -hmm. slightly updated uh, clothing. So, are they really that different after all? And what does it mean? Uh, does it mean for us going forward. And uh, our conclusion uh, in this report when it comes to uh, Russia's di direction, right, of, is fairly gloomy. Uh, we think uh, that because the um, uh, indoctrination and some of the narratives the regime spreads, they go beyond just Putin, right? As I mentioned before, they actually rely also on deep-seated um, susceptibility of the, some groups uh, within the Russian society to these narratives uh, in combination with repressiveness uh, and the war more pro-liberal alternative groups are being kicked out of the country, unfortunately. And we are looking at the something uh, that's emerging in Russia that can actually be quite uh, sustainable, especially given unfortunate failure of the sanctions also to uh, kind of undermine uh, the Putin regime, at least for now. Uh, so going forward from the foreign policy perspective, I think this ideology building effort will create enough resilience uh, for the regime and will provide the legitimation instrument to just justify uh, the misfortunes uh, and mm -hmm. mistreatment, quote unquote, that the Russian society undergoes. So that that is one um, uh, conclusion uh, that I wanted to make. And also, um, when it comes to the democratic nature of this regime, this is where
where I think there's a disagreement between me and, uh, me and Sergei. I actually think that democratic legitimation of autocratic regimes is not entirely new. In the 20th century, uh, you've seen uh, that democracy indeed has become the, my, the main kind of uh, to the, the, the only game in town, even if it's not really democracy. But uh, as I always tell to my students, uh, Georgetown, uh, the more evil regime is, the more likely it is to, to use people's name uh, in its title, right? People's Republic or something like that. If they need to highlight it, chances are it's the most autocratic, totalitarian, evil regime there is. Uh, but the point that they need to do it, and they've been it, doing it for 20th century, I think uh, just comes to, real, uh, to show that it's not in this, democratic legitimation is not entirely in you for 21st uh, century. Yeah, the, the German Democratic Republic, uh, you know, the East German government sort of comes to mind. But maybe, you know, it seems like there is some agreement between you two on uh, that right now, post uh, invasion of Ukraine, Putin has sort of um, uh, is trying to sort of foment or create a, a, a cohesive ideology that uh, can can unify the country both around the war effort and around uh, his regime. And I've seen some, you know, concern that this could lead to sort of a North Koreanization of, of Russia. Urbanization. Yeah. Urbanization. Uh, and but it also strikes me that there are some vulnerabilities uh, when we've seen sort of far right nationalist bloggers critiquing the way the war has been run. Now the Kremlin decided, well, sort of enough is enough, particularly after Prigozhin, that they needed to, to crack down uh, on those that sort of perhaps maybe drunk the Kool-Aid a little too much or, or, or believed in the ideology that, they, uh, uh, that the regime was pushing perhaps too much. I'm, I'm Sergey, I'm curious of where you see this going forward now, that if there is a kind of an ideological effort now on the part of the regime, um, how do you think this is going to sort of play out uh, with in, inside of Russia? Max, I think, I think it's exactly the right point. And this is why modern dictators prefer the spin model. Being a fear dictator, especially with the ideology, is dangerous business. If there are people in your audience who think about career choices, I highly uh, suggest not to go this way uh, because it's, uh, it's a dangerous path. Exactly because if you indoct indoctrinate people, and Marie is correct, this is super dangerous. If Putin teaches that in school, we'll have a generation of ideological Russians. But then these Russians uh, and their parents We'll start asking questions, why Mr. Putin doesn't stick to his values? Why does he still negotiate with those people? Why is he corrupt? Why he himself is not a loyal family man and has extramarital affairs? And then you'll have a challenge from Prigozhin or Srilko, from Z bloggers. And that's why, on one hand, durability of this regime increases. On the other hand, personally, for Mr. Putin, that may be super dangerous. And so I think I think this is something uh, which explains why uh, as in international environment changes, as technological and media environment changes, a lot more dictators want to be in this business and business of spin dictators because it's you're just corrupt dictator. You live and you let live. You bribe and co-opt your potential challengers. Sometimes you need to use targeted repression, but then people don't know that. Uh, and if repression is not open, then uh, people are okay with you staying in power because repression is actually not popular. In one of the research papers that uh, we wrote with Dan uh, preparing to write this book, we show that people don't appreciate uh, leaders who use repression. And they are actually not aware of uh, spin dictatorships using much of the repression. Let me just add a couple more things. We mentioned 2022 a few times. I think it was a mistake. So Maria correctly said this move was a bad move for Putin's own uh, chances to stay in power. I fully agree. And I think he made a mistake. And I think dictators make mistakes. And this is not a bug. It's a feature of dictatorial system. You don't have enough feedback. You don't have competitors who criticize you. So you just don't get enough uh, reasonable information. And so sometimes you overreach. Actually, last year, there were two books called Overreach, one about Chinese regime overreaching in foreign policy and one about Russia going into Ukraine. So it's uh, it's something which is uh, very much in the nature of uh, dictatorial regimes. Now, another thing I would say is Putin's ideology, indeed, his 
uh, gamble for resurrection. In the book, we talk about uh, spin dictatorships, which sometimes go back in time, as Maria has said. And uh, we give an example of Venezuela, where Chavez was a typical spin dictatorship. And Maduro is a typical fear dictator. Why? Because he has neither the charisma nor oil money. So to stay in power, he decided to gamble for resurrection and did that quite successfully. We agree that he doesn't have an ideology. This is not a Bolivarian revolution. It's not. It's just a brutal, a brutal repressive uh, regime. But he's been quite successful with the use of repression. But there are some regimes which don't do that. We talk about Ecuador. We talk about Armenia, which democratized. This is also something which is quite common. We see also how democracies move to spin dictatorships like Tunisia or Serbia are definitely in that, uh, evolving in this direction. So I won't say that spin dictators are destined to be a short-lived transitory phase. We don't know that because this is a reasonably recent phenomenon. So we don't have enough data on how they end up after whatever, 10, 20, or 30 years. So here we are pretty agnostic, but we say that they do face this challenge that if you want your economy to prosper, you need people with tertiary education. And these people are usually very critical. It's very hard to silence them. And in that sense, uh, some dictators panic and go back in time. But once again, if you're a brutal dictator, you're in danger. And so I don't recommend this occupational choice. Maria, maybe um, one last question. No, uh, we, we constantly go back and forth where, where you're the Russian pessimist and I'm the American <laughs> optimist. But, but perhaps I sort of offer one maybe slight sense of optimism here that is there a degree of kind of Russian uh, resilience to ideology in the sense of, you know, the, 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 during the Soviet period when Sergei was talking about, we're, we're used to indoctrin indoctrination and then I think had a, had b developed a very high, uh, for sake of a better term, BS meter and, and sort of understood when they were being, you know, peddled falsehoods and, and, and got and understood how to sort of decipher regime narratives. And I'm curious if maybe one of the challenges that Putin has in trying to sort of have an, a coherent ideology is that he's constantly having to shape shift because, you know, there's a recognition about what he's essentially trying to do and trying to have a regime ideology. And some of the things that we've seen of, of uh, viewership of state uh, of state television has declined, I think, uh, since the war began, where people sort of recognize they're being spun. So is there, you know, if we're looking for a, sort of a, a source of optimism here about the, the future of the Rus Russian uh, public space, you know, perhaps that they just won't buy it uh, to the degree that I think perhaps the Kremlin would want. Uh, it is uh, true indeed, uh, Max, this is where I'm with you. <laughs> and uh, I think Sergey will also agree. Uh, they do, it, certainly there's a lot of variation within the Russian society, actually, but not as much as one would expect. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why um, comparison, direct comparisons between uh, Russia and Nazis Germany are missing the point. Uh, ironically, because the, Russian, the, the German society has been extremely mobilized and it was clashed between different civil groups, organizations that actually polarized the society and made possible uh, Hitler's uh, coming to power. In the Russian case, we see something different. It's a largely a pathetic uh, society with a very uh, difficult history of repressions, uh, the Soviet system and whatnot. And a large majority of the society, so there's hawks, but this is a minority. And there are also liberals who are also minority, like me and Sergei, who are also minority. And then the rest of people who just go with the flow. They have like the so-called um, um, maybe 30 to 40 percent of the society tend to embrace uh, consistently the beliefs that are imposed for the, on them by the uh, propaganda. They often literally echo the state TV narratives, but they don't really incorporate them as deeply. And so if tomorrow, for example, you suddenly had uh, Sergei become the Russian president, very likely after uh, several months, you'll have the Russian society, 60% of the Russian society, lining up behind the ideals of the Western liberalism. I wouldn't be even uh, surprised to see that. Uh, my favorite example is 2015 
2015 uh, invasion, uh, Russian interference in Syria, when uh, in September 2015, 60%, 70% thought it was not such a good idea uh, to go into, to send tr military troops into Syria because we didn't need that Afghanistan. And in October 2015, after several weeks of propaganda, uh, about the same 70% thought that was actually a good idea to support Assad militarily. Uh, so again, within the span of several weeks, it happens. And certainly uh, this degree of indifference, as Navalny has called it, he called it the ultimate fight between the good and neutrality, the apathy, right, the, the, the indifference. Uh, unfortunately, is bad, uh, this indifference is both bad and good. It's something that made such horrible war possible, but it's something that potentially can uh, uh, support, uh, can condition certain change in, foreign, in the Russian policies uh, when somebody else other than Putin comes to power. And last but not the least, another point that we um, did not mention today, which is important to indoctrination and ideology topic, is the role of the elites. I also wanted to flag uh, Chen, uh, for example, in his book on the Russian and Chinese ideology, points out that uh, the strength of elite commitment to the ideology building is one of the key uh, elements for, for us to be able to judge whether a regime has an ideology. And in the Russian case, until, at least, until, until recently, right, you seem to have had a relative reluctance of the Russian so-called system liberals, technocrats, to line up behind uh, this um, regime. I agree with that, uh, but also my own research on the Russian elites showed that, unfortunately, the key decision makers, the top 100, the top uh, 30, um, you name it, is some weird mixture of the Soviet-linked Siloviki, the KGB people, and the Minklatura, Soviet ruling el uh, class elites. Unfortunately, those groups tend to be, their preferences and worldviews tend to be more aligned with Putin's vision. So from that perspective, I think we actually have that more on the side of the successful ideology building. But ultimately, and Sergey pointed that out, I think everything will be determined by Putin's ability to offer a sustainable economic model going forward. So along with uh, ideology building, you certainly also need for the country to economically sustain itself. And mm -hmm. here, the role of the global south, the commodity prices becomes absolutely crucial going forward. Mm -hmm. Sergey, well, I'll turn it over to you for your for last word. Yeah, let me let yeah. me yeah let me be very brief, but uh, support. Uh, uh, support Maria um, in in that I think um, in the in you Max uh, I think uh, in your debate between pessimists and optimists I can say that pessimistic point of view is very justified if you do succeed in brainwashing kids in their formative years with your vision of history you can uh, you can train a lot of people who would be more susceptible to various kinds of ideology in the future and the example about soviet generation is very important these people studied soviet history textbooks and most of them unlike maria or my, myself we've not, uh, they have not read any other history books afterwards and that this is why uh, annexation of crimea was so popular they were brainwashed by imperialist uh, narratives and that's what putin counted on and that's why it worked so well and I think, unfortunately, that matters, and that matters a lot. Now, on the optimistic side, uh, I would say that I also agree with uh, Maria that lots of people are very uh, much uh, indifferent to ideological stances. And I would give another, another example, which is 2018 World Cup, when Putin, for having a successful World Cup, turned off anti-Western propaganda. And Westerners who traveled to, to Russia for the World Cup were amazed by hospitality of Russians uh, towards Westerners. And in that sense, uh, this is kind of, for me, it's also an optimistic message. And the more optimistic message is indeed, as Maria said, probably this regime is has shortened its uh, lifespan. And hopefully we will not have decades of propaganda, more than several years of propaganda uh, before this regime has changed and Putin is replaced, hopefully by somebody better. Great. Well, we. We always like to end our conversations on on Russia and Putin on an optimistic note when we can. Uh, Sergey, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Maria, thank you, of course, uh, for, for being here. And unfortunately, we'll have to end it there.
Uh, I think it was a fantastic conversation, and I'd also like to encourage everyone to take out their phones and please subscribe to our podcast, The Russian Roulette, uh, and our sister podcast, The Europhile, where we discuss a lot of these issues uh, in, in depth. Um, and thank, I just want to thank you again for, for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.